it's, it feels like um, so many different women, and all of us see, have every experience that we have is just a little bit different. And so I'm going to say some things that I have found so helpful for me, but it might not even be helpful for you, but hopefully at least something will be helpful for you along the way, or you can take it and grow with it and think it through and adapt it for what would bless you. Um, so on your in your booklets on the power of partnership, I'm um, not sure what page it is, but that's where we're going to start. And I have really wrestled with Understanding what is to be my role as a wife. I, like David mentioned too, like when we were first married, I, I'm like, I'm this outgoing person. He's more laid back. So who's going to run this, you know, boat here or whatever. And I mean, I don't know, different people would be like, you can't let her run things and stuff. And, you know, he's trying to try real hard. And I, I wasn't going to, I mean, I was going to try to let him run it too. You know, I didn't want to be this bossy wife. Um, so yeah, a lot of trial and a lot of error. <laughs> oh. I just, but I just have been so refreshed with how scripture helps us. Like, yes, we appreciate people's advice, but God gets it right. He's the creator and we can go back to the word. Okay. What does the word say? So look at Genesis two, especially like verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That's God's recipe right there, just embedded in that verse. Um, it is not good. That not good means in the Hebrew very, is very bad, actually. Um, for one thing, man, just a man, um, you know, to represent God as the image of God, as trying to represent God, God is in relationship, and here's this one man. Like, he needs to be in relationship to represent God, first of all. Um, anyway, then he says, I will make a helper suitable. Like, in King James, it's help, meet. But that word meet means suitable, or like a, like a, um, I think I wrote it down here, designed in a way that harmonizes seamlessly. Two parts aligned perfectly to function as a whole unit like two pieces of a puzzle or like we're different, but yet we fit together. And I really like the analogy of a needle and a thread. They, they both are needed to accomplish sewing. Like the husband's like the needle that kind of goes and directs, but that thread has to be connected and followed behind and do that, you know, binding together like threads do. Very, very interesting analogy. But anyway, so here we have this role. I was listening to the other man saying about, okay, there's a role and there's responsibilities. And I didn't really separate them. I just lumped them all in role. But the idea is being a helper. So we can be helpers whether we're married or single. We're, as women, God designed us. The female, the woman is designed to be helpers. Like that's our makeup and how we'll get into that some more. And the man is, is designed to lead, um, to have dominion. There's different places you can explore Genesis on that as well. Um, but they're actually designed, they, they've been made different, and it works. Um, anyway, so what are some challenges we face as women if our husbands don't lead, how are we going to help? Like, what is this? Um, so those are some things that we want to talk about today, and I'd, I'm really hoping to get through this pretty quick, and then we'll have time for some just discussion or an questions. If you have questions about what is it, you know, how does this fit in this kind of situation or that kind of situation? Common challenging areas, family worship, child discipline, household repairs, financial responsibilities, who does, you know, who does what? Um how, you know, leading and building the relationship. Sometimes the husbands don't do much with that. So we all face challenges of some kind because we are in a broken world. And um, well, there again, how does the Bible help us? Now, I like First Peter 3, and this is a serious challenge. Here's the wife. It says, if any obeys not the word. 
if a, if a wife has a husband that doesn't even obey the word. Now, that would be a serious challenge, and I hope none of your husbands are in that. Like, I hope none of us wives are in that category. But there's even help for that. But I'm saying our problems or our conflicts or our dilemmas are not that serious. So surely this would help us. So let's look at just a quick go down through how Peter advises these women. And so we can kind of learn from that still. Um, some points to guide us as wives. Uh, follow Christ's example of submission to his father as given in the chapter before. And, and you can study chapter 2, First Peter 2. It's a very good section on how Christ suffered and how he submitted himself, what it looked like for him. And then likewise us as women we're called to do that same example to follow Christ. Um, it's, we could talk all day on that one, but we'll keep rolling a little bit further. Um, and then it says in verse one um, that if the if they don't obey the word, this is in this particular scenario. If a husband doesn't obey the word, they could be won without the word by the conduct of the wife. So our our conduct, our actions, our just our our way of life will speak for itself without us using words. And verse 2 talks about God-fearing, chaste behavior. Verse 3 talks about not pursuing outer beauty. Verse 4 talks about a meek and quiet spirit. And um, just, again, emphasizing that it says that they may be won by this. That shows that there is hope for our husbands to um, to change, especially, let's say, in a situation where someone is actually not even obeying the word. There is hope for change. <laughs> not saying it will automatically happen and yet there's a lot of hope there but the other side of it would be then if we use words what happens then and that's that's a big question there um, verse 5 relating rightly comes from hoping or trusting in God and we'll talk some more about that as we go through verse 6 says how how we should be like Sarah she obeyed Abraham um, some books will say I have a book in, on my shelf that says how we just need to obey our husbands no matter what because the, the scripture and if they tell you to do wrong, you know, Sarah obeyed Abraham because he told her to lie. I don't think it says, I don't think we can say that from that scripture that it's okay to do that. No, God, we have all the scripture to guide us and God does not condone lying. Even if our husbands wants us to lie, like, no, I'm not trying to say that. Uh, verse 7 is an interesting verse. I'll read that one. Up, you see the scriptures on the pink section above. Likewise, husbands, live together according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, the female, as truly being co-heirs together of the grace of life. Not cutting off your prayers. This is a modern King James version. It doesn't read quite like my favorite King James. But anyway, um, and some of the other trans... I, it's not that I have a certain favorite. I shouldn't say that. But the idea of... Um, husbands dwelling with your wives according to knowledge. Like, did you ever think about what does that mean? Like, dwell with them according to knowledge. How are they going to get knowledge? How are they going to know what, their wife? They're supposed to dwell with them according to knowledge, but how are they going to get the knowledge? Anyway, what about the scripture where it says, children, obey your parents? How are children going to obey parents? Well, the parents are going to have to help them obey. How are husbands going to dwell with wives according to knowledge? The wife is going to have to help them understand. I think one translation that we had, um, I forget which one it is, it says, husbands dwell with your wives in an understanding way. Well, how are they going to know women without us helping them? And so we want to get into that a little bit too, hopefully. We'll see. All right, so let's say we run into a problem. Um, what would be an example of something that it's like, okay, we're waiting on them to to do, make, fix something or do something or something. And sometimes we can be waiting on them. For, it can feel very serious and significant, and they're not doing a thing. What do we do? <laughs> um, so let's, let's put yourself, maybe you can think of in your own marriage something that you just kind of... You don't quite know what your place is. It's just like he's not doing what you were hoping and now to figure out your place. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we have this challenge. First of all, let's thank God that it's not the challenge of an unbelieving husband. Like, always remember that is something to be thankful for. 
Anyway, so our, um, our temptation in the challenge is to jump to step eight, which is talking to our husbands about whatever this is, wanting them to improve, about where they should improve. We are tempted to do that, to jump into that without thinking about what I'm, we're getting ready to share, steps one through seven, which is looking at ourselves first. Now, I have it here as steps, but it kind of overlaps. It's not a certain order as such. It's just different things to think about. Before we just jump in and talk to our husband so quickly, and I'm talking to myself here, I tend to be very quick to talk. And, like, my husband was very accurate when he said that. Like, now, one thing he, I don't know if he was quite accurate on was, so, <laughs> but, but no, he did very well for presenting a lot. No, he said, um, I just remember this conversation we had, and he was like, you mean you don't hear your words in your head before you say them? I don't think he quite said it that way, but he, we've talked about it many times since. And I was just like, no, I, I don't hear what I'm, I have to say it in order to think it, like I'm an external processor. And he was like, what? You know, and he was at the point, he said, how can this woman be a Christian the way she talks? <laughs> you know, it's just not, I, well, well, so for him, you know, he would think these thoughts, but then he'd be like, no, and then he'd revise it, you know, in his own head first, and then maybe more revising, and finally out, it comes out of his mouth, which is right. But then for me, you know, I don't really even hear it in my head. I almost have to say it or maybe write it somehow to get my, figure out what I'm thinking. So I need to be, I need to tell him, hey, I'm thinking out loud, <laughs> not just blurt it out. Say, help him know where I'm at, too, you know. That was just a, that's just a little side note. Anyway, um, so let's look at ourselves first. And this this is where we want to talk about a couple different things. Um, so just a question you ever those of you who, who are expecting babies or have had babies have you ever thought about why is it hard to think of a baby boy name i know we women talk about this in in our church you know you want to you want a name that's cute you know for a baby boy and yet they're going to grow up to be a man it's going to sound right right why is that um let's just follow on step one where it says understand the man it is not easy To move from the carefree days of boyhood to shouldering the weight of responsibility of manhood. Like, it is a lot. It is really hard. And I don't know how many of your your husbands are in the 20s and 30s, but it is a hard, they have a huge adjustment. Like, being a man is a huge responsibility that I don't think we women get a hold of, at least not in our younger years. I just, like, like we had, we were got, we got married when my husband was 21 and I was 19. We had our first child when I was 20. So we were young and having children. And I remember feeling like, oh, this is just overwhelming. And he's not understanding my needs at all, you know. And I would try to explain it. And oh, you sort of work at it and you slowly get a little more explained. But it still just, it just seemed like he wasn't getting at how hard this is, how intense life is. So we had six children, and so I was 20 with the first one. The last one was 31, so in that time, it was about every two years kind of ish. And toward the last of that, I think somewhere along the way I told him that, you know, when I'm, I'm weaker, you know, physically, then it just makes me weaker emotionally and spiritually and I'm just more into you know temptations are harder and stronger and I just and I think that kind of clicks sometimes those logical calm you know be calm um as you discuss can kind of kind of help it click but anyway now so so that was in the intense years and we sort of muddled our way through but now we're empty nesters I don't have this even the last number of years I don't have this overwhelming demands oh it's just rolling in from all directions at all times 24 7 you know i have this free life and here he continues to have the responsibility of manhood he will have that all his life my motherhood that hard stuff was for a season of life i didn't really understand that so now i'm getting my rest time more what i'm saying and he continues to carry this responsibility it just means a lot to our husbands when we acknowledge it that we appreciate them carrying the weight. Just understand that weight that they carry. Another thing to understand about men, and we can make a long list. I just picked a few. Um, they're very sensitive to the possibility of failure. 
Like, just think about for yourself, are there certain areas of life that you're extra sensitive? So, okay, now tra- translate that over. They are sensitive to failing. Um, it's Sometimes it can look so overwhelming to man that it's easier not to try than to try and fail. So they're kind of just... God designed them to to be accomplishers, and so this thing of failure can kind of just hit at that really at their core. Um, we're more designed for relationships, so we're more sensitive maybe to like rejection or some things like that. But just try to understand where they're coming from. Also, they're wired to really focus with their brains right in on this one thing and really have this intense focus on on one thing. And God made them that way as well. Um, so. If you really focus hard, can you imagine? Wouldn't they want a break from focusing hard? Like, have you ever been driving along or sitting together quietly, and it's been a while, and you're asking your husband, like, so what are you thinking about? And he says, nothing. (laughs) Well, their brains must rest, too. They really focus in. Um, And we don't understand that in the same way. We want to value how God made them. Um. So another one I have is um, believing in your husband's good intentions. Like, ask yourself, do you get everything done that you intend to do? No. I mean, we have grace for ourselves. Let's remember, they have good intentions. Like, they don't just get up in the morning and say, you know, I'm just not going to, I'm just going to, today I'm just not going to try to be a very good husband. Like, they don't do that. They have good intentions. A big one for me in my journey has been um, talking to the Lord about this, about whatever it is that's on our heart, that it feels like maybe our husbands are not hearing well or not caring or t- maybe a load that they're, we would have wanted them to carry and they're not. Um, tell the Lord whatever it is you want it to tell your husband. Ask yourself how many of these things you've been commenting on. Okay, uh, that Bible says without the word, just, just Hold back on those words. Tell the Lord what your husband isn't getting done. Tell the Lord how it makes you feel. Tell the Lord about the burden you feel for your loved ones who are also affected by the lack of leadership or whatever the situation is. It's often, it's not so much for ourselves as it is for our loved ones that we feel like, oh, you know, this child or this person we care about in some way is being affected by our husband's lack of whatever actions or whatever. Um Let's tell the Lord. Continuing on about telling the Lord, cast yourself on the Lord on an emotional level. He knows us through and through. He invites us to come to him and pour out every emotion to him. And I just love how the Psalms, God gave us the Psalms. You, as women, get into the Psalms and and think of them as your own personal prayer to God, just to help you get get that out of your heart and into, into God's. It's on his shoulders. Like, he's here. He invites us to do that. He's like, I guess when I used to read the Psalms, I used to think, okay, here's, you know, David is writing these Psalms or whoever the writer was. And, and you know, he's having trouble or he's having bad attitudes or he's having whatever. And finally, he, he figures out he should turn to the Lord. And so he turns to the Lord and he ends well, you know. No, 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 no. The Psalms... That, that was worship, too. The first part of these complaints, that is a part of worship. Lamenting before the Lord. Like, let let God in on that. This is Sharing emotions is what builds bonds even in our marriages, too. But emotions are a good part of us, our makeup. And it's for bonding, and it's for us to bond with God. Um, step four talks about, especially like when you have issues that you just go on and on, and you can't quite figure out how to find your way through. Identify... Um, what are the deeper issues? What are my desires, my beliefs, my thoughts? These lots of time there's something in there to unlock, a puzzle to unlock in that. We just pray for much help that God would show us what it is that I'm really wanting. Is there something that I'm desiring that I'm letting rule my heart? Now, in the in David's last um, talk, you remember the hearts with the thrones? And it was like Jesus on the throne or self on the throne. Like each of us had those two in our hearts. That's because we're in the human bodies, we're not going to get that self out till we get to heaven. Like, so we want to think about: is it is who's really ruling me? Who am I really worshiping? Um, so these are there are some really good. We're going to run out of time probably. Really good, just a checklist, just questions to ask yourself. Scriptures. Um, I know 
I, this one, there's a wrong way to be right. Like as women, we can feel like we're right. We've thought about all these different angles and we know, we, we just know what's right. But there's a wrong way to be right. Am I trusting and relying on myself or on God? Um, this is the one that really hits with me personally. It's a, it's a trap I tend to fall into. Leaning on my own finite understanding to determine what is best, rise, right, wise, and good is making myself into my own God. A symptom of this is when I hang on to how I think things should happen and how I think other people should respond. Another one can be like, um, am I seeking for glory for myself? Like, let's say I want my husband to get stuff fixed around the house. I want him to do this yard work. Why? What? Like, I can want him to do it for God's glory or for my own. Or like, so people think good of me or so people think good of God. Or I can want my children to behave because I want I want God to get the glory, or I can want them to behave because I want people to think I'm a good mom. There's just a lot can go on in our hearts, and we can jump on and off. Like we can, you know, have Jesus on the throne one minute, and self can push him off the next minute. Like I'm not saying we're not Christians. No, God is very gracious, and He sees much, much that we do against him all day long that we're not aware of. But he does make us aware of some things, and our part is to respond. He says, hey, Christine, you have been proud in this area. That My part is to humble myself and repent. But God sees a lot more than he shows me because I'm, I'm not him. Like, I don't see all that, but I'm, it's there. And that's where we can get that humility that God has to put up with a put up with a lot with us and we can also then have grace on our companions um where am i banking my hopes i just i'm just kind of um going down through surrendering our desires this is one thing that i didn't get just under the pink box strong and passionate desires are not wrong in themselves so here i'm i'm created by god um with this very passionate personality and I I don't know growing up it was not I didn't get a lot of good feedback about that <laughs> um, I felt like I was why wasn't I a man I mean like I was just this leader and this uh, kind of like the strength was like ugly about me and that was the journey for me to find that you know God made me that way because he wanted me that way and I didn't realize that years and years and years later he would be working and preparing me to to have the kind of courage you need to have to talk to walk with women like it's not for everybody he created me for that and like I that's that's his good work and so strength is it has its place like he wanted me to be strong but there's places certain places it doesn't I mean there's places that you doesn't have a place either but I guess I remember you know, we'd be talking and going over. So so let's say we, we run into a conflict as a married couple. So then we'll go back over. So what happened here? And, you know, and I'd be like, well, you know, and I'd be having my ideas on my husband. Be like, well, no, it's not what you said. It's how you said it, you know. And I'd be like, okay. I would be getting this feedback that if I have a strong desire, then I'm automatically just going to be out of his good graces. Like, that's just going to be wrong. And yet I'd have them. Like, and to... No, it's not wrong to have a to be passionate. If God makes you that way, that's how He made you. No, what's wrong is if you are not surrendered in your desires, like surrendered to God's will, surrendered to your husband's will. And so Jesus was passionate in His prayer. That He's like, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. And that's something we can each do, and we can we constantly need to keep doing it. Um, we had a situation, I could tell you so many stories. <laughs> um, so with our, we had four daughters, and then we had a son, and then another daughter. So with our first four daughters, as a mom, you know, it's kind of my job to raise them in a lot of ways, although they love their daddy and he would do stuff with them. But I was more the teacher and the trainer. And well, then when our son came along, you know, it was more David's job. And by that time, our girls were getting in their teens, and some of my um, methods of child training, you just don't do with a teen. And I was trying to figure this out, and I wasn't doing too good. And Dave was trying to help me. And so, yeah, our parenting had to change. And 
he would be like, honey, they, they know, uh, I'd be preaching to the girls, you know, and he'd be like, they know that already, you know, be more relational, and we'd be having these differences, and it was good, we both, we needed both of that for them, and, and uh, reading some books on it, and, um, I don't know, we, it was like, okay, I had to learn to back off and let them think for themselves, but then I started doing the same thing with our younger ones, because I'm, I'm so used to parenting the, as the oldest ones. You sort of follow you just your parenting to the oldest, and you forget that, no, your 8-year-old son, you don't reason with him, oh, son, you need to do this because here's the reasons. Well, you might talk about that with your teenager, but you wouldn't talk. You shouldn't use the same parenting style for a teenager as for an 8-year-old, right? And so I'd be like, well, here's the reasons, and then he'd be like, well, I did those reasons, and that's what I thought about all the re- you know I got the reasons out of the way, so that's why I went ahead and did you know things like that. Anyway, so we started running into quite a bit of issues with with our son then. Well, he was a he was quite an active, ornery guy anyway. Plus, his dad is more relational, not so strict, and so some of the training was falling on his dad. And anyway, things were not going so well with this boy. And I remember, okay, this thing, it says, where am I banking my hopes? I just remember feeling terrible and losing sleep and, like, what is going to happen to our son? Um, and it, the temptation is to focus my hope on my husband and his leadership in this in the situation rather than I'm hoping in God and his promises. Like, I I still need to to fulfill my role as helper. I am not the leader. I'm not to do what my husband doesn't want me to do. And and to to just commit things to the Lord over and over, um, you know, we found our way, and yet I think God, I can look back and see how God was putting the puzzle pieces together. Because so my son, and then he had like three other cousins. They lived on the same road. They would they would go do stuff, and oh, they were getting older and older. And, and I was like, I don't know if this boy's going to give his life to the Lord. Like I don't know where this is going to end up. Um, well, meanwhile, he, you know, like you know, boys are wont to do, he starts liking a girl, and they're still in school, and then they're in the youth. Our, in our school, they went to 12th grade, so they're getting older, but they're still in school, and they're in the youth finally, 16, 15, 16, 17, and the girl, older sisters are coming home, Mom, you know what Ken and Meredith were doing? And then, you know, and, and then my husband would be like, well, you know, we have to be kind of careful how we... It was just a lot going on, and I, I just would keep coming back to God. Sometimes I did the did well, and the next time I didn't. But I'm just saying, God has ways of still continuing to help us. And even if the story hadn't turned out as good as it did, God still would have been there. Like I'm not saying that. Yeah, it's we don't know how everything will go, but in this particular situation, I can see now that. Even though we tried to stop this little romance as best as we could or, can, you know, hold it back, uh, I can see how God actually kept my son's heart soft through liking this girl. That if he, because, so then they did continue, had a courtship and they got married and I don't know, were they 21-ish when they got married? It felt so young, but no, what, what can I say, right? Um Oh, so anyway, but being a dad, being a husband and a father, I don't know. It's just like God used this this love in his life to keep him, I don't know, his heart soft. And yeah, he's 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 a very sweet Christian man. So I just thank the Lord. Anyway, we can't just bank our hopes on our husband and the leadership. Um, might I possibly despise my husband? This one, I think, affects us women a lot because, okay, we're, we've got these feminine abilities. We can multitask. We can perceive things. We, we've got this perception all over. We can see into a lot of things and we can feel we're better and we kind of look down on them. That's what I mean by despise. Like we can kind of look down on men because they can kind of be clumsy in relationships, slow to catch on. So, our husband, we've got to remember, our husbands were created by God to be the way they are. God gave men the design they need. They need to have that design to fulfill their role. To despise my husband is to despise his creator. That is not okay. Look at the pictures. Now, just think about how God made men. He made them able to focus. They can invent things. I like Think of all the inventions we use in our kitchens. Look at these pictures. 
things like who made me- such a thing as metal? It was men invented metal. Men invented, you know, the blenders, the fridges, the stove. Like all of these things are invented by men. They they have that thinking ability that we don't have. Like. I mean, maybe I, I would venture to say almost everything was probably invented by men, and and we we take it for granted all the ways they make our lives better. Um, we take for granted how they have a good judgment. We can gather information really quickly, but they can focus deep. And then here, you know, and we need that. So we want to really, really value that. We want to tell them we appreciate that. Um, we're going to need to skip on around here. Um, step five is about humbling ourselves, repenting. When you come aware of sin, I know for myself, I can tend to just sort of give myself a scolding. Oh, Christine, you know, you're being proud, whatever, and not take that time to have that personal, Lord, I sinned against you. I am sorry. Like that personal prayer with the Lord. I just really encourage us to, to go the whole way. Like don't just, we talk about repentance a lot around here, but don't just, Acknowledge the sin just sort of to yourself. But no, let, let's get, get personal with God. Uh, releasing our husband, cultivating a sweet spirit. I think God created us women to know how to be sweet. It, I think you, you, we can even fake sweetness like if we want to. But like, it is such an important thing. Uh, my daughter, Krista, this bottom picture um, is my oldest daughter. She just has this sweet smile and she uses a lot. You know, smiles don't take any extra time. They're free. Like, if we run out of time and money, we can still smile. <laughs> Let's use it. Uh, tell our husbands what we admire about them, how much we appreciate them. Think about what they are doing. That is such a good and helpful thing and not just adding comments about what we wish they would change. Even things like faithfully going to work every day. See, we can almost think... Oh, my husband loves his job more than he loves me. He just wants to work all these late, long hours, and he doesn't even care about being at home. Well, in his mind, though, he's likely he is going to work for you. And I, I didn't get that for years. And I, I don't know, one time David told me, we were just talking about it. And I was struggling with all these hours he's putting as he's trying to get his business going. But then he told me, well, no, but it's for me. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, you just, you, it's just communicating. Um, last year we talked about being his playmate sexually. That's at the bottom of that page there with Krista on it. There again, uh, you can maybe get last year's material. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's out there or not. Um, there is just a lot of, of communication needed in that area. Really, really a lot. We can be in this motherly role that, you know, we put all the children to bed and we're sort of in, just sort of in this motherly role. Now we have to put our husbands to bed. That's just... No, that's not how it is. God didn't create it that way. We need time to relax and play ourselves. Why not think of it in a different way? Okay, let's keep going here. So let's. we do want to have a chance to talk to our husbands. So I have to brush through all these steps one to seven, too, kind of fast here. But um, I, I, want, I don't want us to remember, like we heard earlier today, that God has joined us together. So what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So it's worth fighting for your marriage. It's worth talking. You need to. You don't just say, well, I guess, you know, he's not doing his part, so I'll just, you know, whatever and not. No, communicating is, is going to have to happen. But these are things to think about ahead of time. And, and go over this material some more in depth. Look up the scriptures. Um, pray a lot. Pray for wisdom. And James 3.17 has these the wisdom that is from above is first truly pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. This is like, I know I have one of wisdom. Like, do I talk to him or do I just let it go? So I ask for wisdom and I think about this verse and it's like, the first requirement, is your heart pure? And it's like, oh Lord, I hear you. I need to think about this. And so, yes. We, we need to have a pure heart. But then there is still, it doesn't mean you just be quiet. Like you still go talk to them. Um, another one I especially highlighted here is about the pressure. Um, for a little bit further down the list, um, be sure to take care of any pressure you feel. If we feel pressure, we'll communicate pressure. Like that's where we got to come back and get our hearts off with the Lord and surrender to the Lord. Lord, I will be your servant. If you want me to talk to him, if, if I should, help me know. Um, 
Here's some hints on approaching our husband. I have a sandwich. You've heard of the sandwich principle where you've got both slices of bread, and, and that represents words of affirmation, appreciation. Like, um, I, honey, I don't at all want to take your place as a leader. I'm not trying to, um, you know, just telling him where you're coming from, the angle you're coming from, and then say what needs to be said. But then again, words of affirmation and respect validate them. Reminding them that you want to stay in your place. Like, just get, they need a lot of words like that, or it, it helps to have a lot of words like that. Let's say we're scared we're going to cry. I have a few words about crying. Um, one of the things, I mean, as women, we are, that is, for a lot of us, that is how we process our emotions. Like, and so if we're going to hate that about ourselves, then we're also hating our creator, and that's not okay either. So, I think, and and we've talked about this, so if you cry, maybe the reason your husband doesn't like it when you cry is because he doesn't know what to do. So tell him what you like. It's like, say, I want you just to hold me in your arms. I want you to rub my neck. Whatever it is you want him to do, just tell him. So when I cry, here's some things to do. Honey, I'm getting ready to have this conversation, and I probably will cry, and this is what I want you to do. Like, just go ahead and be direct about that. Um, they really... It's really important to be direct with their husbands because that's how their brain works better. They're just, like for women, we know when we, like, we'll give each other hints. Like if we say, you know, I would be like, I, you know, I have all this canning to do and I'd be talking about my work and I would expect if possibly you would, can I come and help you? That is not men. All they see is just this complaining wife. You know, I just have all this. Well, no, we're asking for help, but we don't know how. Um, no, and, and so sometimes we'll bravely ask for help, but we'll first give all these reasons why we're asking for help. Don't. Don't give reasons. Just ask, you know, honey, I was wondering if you could help me with something. And if you can't, that's okay, you know. Just a simple request is very much, because they really do want to know what we want, but Please don't, you know, go all around the bush. Oh, that just, they don't understand that. Um, we had a scenario here. So, so we've got a mix in our staff, you know, women and men, mo- a lot of single women. And so, um, one of them's coming in and my husband used to be a mechanic before we came here. And one of them's coming in saying all this about their car. Well, all, you know, they, they just seem like something, whatever with their car. And we were all gathered around men and women. And I was like, in my mind, it's like, honey, you know, she wants you to offer to look at it. But he didn't, he just didn't say a word. And so we left, and I said, honey, she wanted you to offer. He's like, no, no, I don't think so. He said, that's just you, because we've been over this many times that I, I expect, I would like for him to offer. It's just it's hard for me to ask. And he's, he's learned to offer, but. Yeah, there again, it had, you had to be direct about that too, right? Anyhow, so I, he's like, no, she didn't mean for me to offer to help. So let's just have this little, let's do a little survey. Let me just find out, you know, whether, how this is with the other women, the single women. I don't know. Were you there, Chelsea? All right. Anyway, um, yeah, all the women would have agreed that that was a request for help. <laughs> it just, anyway, we, we think so differently. So that's where our communication comes in. Um, last one I have, if you're the talkative one, be especially careful with your words and try not to overwhelm your husband with them. He is likely gifted with more physical strength than you, and he has learned to refrain himself from hurting you with his strength. Just think about that. They're learning a lot, too. In the same way, even though you may be more gifted with expressing yourself through words, you will want to learn to hold that gift back as you relate. Just learn to hear from them.